Okay, now we're going to talk about the supervised learning problem and set down a little bit of notation. So we'll have an outcome measurement y, which is, goes by various names, dependent variable, response, or target. And then we'll have a, a vector of p-predictor measurements, which we usually call x. They go by the name inputs, regresses, covariates, features, or independent variables. And we distinguish two cases. One is the regression problem. Y is quantitative, such as price or blood pressure. Um, in the classification problem, Y takes values in a, in a finite, unordered set, such as survived or died, the digit classes 0 to 9, the cancer class of the tissue sample. Now, we have training data pairs, x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn, yn. So again, x1 is a vector of p measurements. y1 is usually a single response variable. And so these are examples or instances uh, uh, of these measurements. So the objectives of supervised learning is as, as follows. On the basis of the training data, we would like to accurately predict unseen test cases, understand which inputs affect the outcome and how, and also to assess the quality of our predictions and the inferences. So, uh, by way of philosophy, uh, uh, as you take this course, we, we want to, uh, not just to give you a laundry list of methods, but we want you to, we, we, to know that it's important to understand the ideas behind the various techniques so you know where and when to use them. Because in your own work, um, you're going to have problems that we've never seen before, you've never seen before, and you want to be able to judge which methods are likely to work well and which ones are not likely to work well. As well, uh, uh, not just prediction accuracy is important, but it's, it's important to, 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 to uh, try simple methods first in order to grasp the more sophisticated ones. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on, on linear models, yeah. linear regression and yeah. linear logistic regression. Yeah. These are simple methods, but they're very effective. And it's also important to, to understand how well a method is doing. Right? It's easy to apply an algorithm. You can, nowadays, you can just run software. But it's, it's difficult, but also very important to figure out how, methods, is, how well is the method actually working. So you can tell your boss or your collaborator that when you apply this method we've developed, this is how likely, how well you're, you're likely to do tomorrow. And, and the, in some cases, you won't do well enough to actually use the method, and you'll have to improve your algorithm or maybe collect better data. Now, the other, other thing we want to convey just through the course and hopefully through uh, the examples is that this is a really exciting, uh, exciting area in research. I mean, statistics in general is a very hot area, statistical learning and machine learning is of uh, more and more importance, and it's really exciting. It, the, the area is not in, it gelled in any way in the sense that uh, there's a lot of good methods out there, but a lot of challenging problems that aren't solved. So, Especially in, in recent yeah. years, Rob, with, yeah. the, you know, with the on, onset of big data and, yeah. and, and the coined the word, the word data science. Right, and uh, statistical learning, as Trevor mentioned, is a, a fundamental ingredient in, the, in uh, this new area of, of data science. So you might be wondering, where does this term supervised, and un, and, uh, supervised learning come from? It's actually a very clever term, and I, I would like to take credit for it, but I can't. It, wasn't, it was developed by someone, in the, I think, in the, in the machine learning area. The idea of supervised learning, you think in, in the kindergarten of a teacher trying to teach a child to classify, to, to uh, discriminate between what, a, say, a house is and a bike. So he might show the child, maybe Johnny, say, uh, Johnny, here's, uh, here's some examples of what a house looks like, and maybe in, 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 in Lego blocks. And here's some examples of what a, what a, what a bike looks like. So, and you, and you sh he tells Johnny this and s shows him examples of each of the classes, and, he, and, and then the child then learns, oh, I see, a house has got sort of square edges and a bike has got some more rounded edges, etc. That's supervised learning because he's given, been given examples of labeled training observations. He's been supervised. And, and, and ex as Trevor just sketched out in, on the previous slide, um, the why there is given, and the, the uh, child tries to learn the, to classify the two objects based on the features, the x's. Now, um, unsupervised learning is another thing, topic of this course. In which that's how I grew up. I see, that's the problem. Okay. Well, so in, in unsupervised learning, now in the kindergarten, now, now Trevor's in kindergarten, and the child was not, Trevor was not given examples of what a uh, house and a bike was. He's, he just sees on the ground lots, l lots of things, right? He sees maybe some houses, some bikes, some other things. And so this, this data is unlabeled. There's no why. Oh, but it's pretty sharp, bro. <laughs> okay. So um, the problem there now is for the child, just it's, it's unsupervised, to try to, to organize in his own mind the common patterns of what he sees. Right? He may uh, look at the object and say, oh, these three things are probably houses. Or, or he doesn't know what they're called houses, but they, they're similar to each other because they have common features. These other objects, maybe they're bikes or other things, they're similar to each other because I see some com commonality. And um, that brings the idea of, of trying to group observations by similarity of features, which is going to be a, a, a major topic of this course, unsupervised learning. 
So more formally, again, there's no outcome variable measured, just a set of predictors. And the objective is more fuzzy. It's sort of, it's not just, it's not to predict why, because there is no why. It's rather to learn about the, how the data is organized and to find which features are important for the organization of the data. So we'll talk about, again, clustering and principal components, which are important um, techniques for un unsupervised learning. One of the other challenges is, is that it's hard to know how well you're doing, right? There's no gold standard, there's no why. So when, you, when you've done a clustering uh, analysis, you don't really know how well you've done. And that's one of the challenges. But nonetheless, it's an extremely important area, um, both because, well, one reason is that the idea of, of unsupervised learning is an important preprocessor for supervised learning. It's often useful to try to organize your features, choose features, based on, on, the, um, on, the, on the Xs themselves, and then use those, those processed or chosen features as input into supervised learning. And, and the last point is that it's a lot easier, it's a lot more common to collect data which is unlabeled, right? Because on the web, for example, if you look at movie reviews, you can, you can uh, a, a computer algorithm can just scan the web and grab reviews. Figuring out whether the review, on the other hand, is positive or negative often takes human intervention. So it's much harder and costly to label data, much easier just to collect unsupervised, unlabeled data. Well, the last example we're going to show you is a wonderful example. It's the Netflix prize. Um, Netflix is, a, is a, a movie rental company in, in the U.S., and, and now you can get the movies online. They used to be um, CD, uh, DVDs that were mailed out. And uh, Netflix set up a competition um, to try and improve on their recommender system. So they created a data set with 400,000 uh, Netflix customers um, and 18,000 movies, and each of these customers had rated, on average, around 200 movies each. So, so each customer had, had not seen, uh, only seen about 1% of the, of the movies. And so you can think of this as having a, a, a very big matrix, um, which is very sparsely populated with ratings between 1 and 5. And then the goal is to try and predict, as, as in all recommender systems, to predict what the customers would think of the other movies based on what they rated so far. So Netflix set up a competition um, which, where they offered a, a $1 million prize for the first team that could improve on their, on their rating system by 10% uh, by uh, some measure. And the design of the competition was very clever. I, I don't know if it was by, by, by luck or not, but the, the root mean score error of the original algorithm was about 9.953, so that's on a scale of, again, 1 to 5. And it took the community, when they announced the, the competition and put the data on the web, it took the community about a, about a month or so to get to have an algorithm which improved upon that. But then it took the community about another three years to actually to, for someone to win the competition. So it's a, it's a, it's a great example. Here's the leaderboard um, at, at the time the competition ended. It was, it was eventually won by a team called uh, Belcourt's Pragmatic Chaos. Um, but a very close second was Ensemble. In fact, they had the same score up to four decim decimal points. Um, and, and the final winner was determined by who submitted their, 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 their final predictions first. Um, so it was a wonderful competition, but what was especially wonderful was the amount of research that it generated. There were thousands, tens of thousands of teams all over the world entered this competition over the period of, of three years, and a whole lot of new techniques were invented in the process. A lot of the winning techniques ended up using a form of uh, a principal components in the presence of missing data. Now, how, how come our name's not on that list, Trevor? Where's our team? Um, <laughs> Uh, that's a good point, Rob. Um, the page isn't long enough. <laughs> I think if we went down a few hundred, you might. <laughs> well, uh, so actually, seriously, we actually tried with a graduate student when the competition started. We spent about three or four months uh, trying to trying to win the competition. And uh, one of the problems with co was computation. Uh, the, the data was so big and our computers were not fast enough that just to try things out took too long. And we realized that the, gr the graduate student um, was probably not going to succeed, and he was probably going to waste three years of his graduate program, which is not a good idea for his career. So we, we basically uh, abandoned ship early on. So I mentioned in the beginning uh, the idea of uh, the field of machine learning, which actually uh, led to the, the, the um, statistical learning area, which we're talking about in this course. Um, and machine learning say, itself arose as a subfield of artificial intelligence, especially with the, the advent of neural networks in the 80s. Um, so it's natural to wonder what's the relationship between statistical learning and machine learning. And there, there's, it's, first of all, the question is hard to answer. We ask that question often. There's a lot of overlap. Machine learning tends to work at larger scales. They tend to work on bigger problems. 
although again the gap tends to be uh, closing because computers, fast computers now are becoming much cheaper. Uh, machine learning worries more about pure prediction and how well things predict. Statistical learning also worries about prediction, but, but also about uh, um, models, tries to come up with models, methods that can be interpreted by scientists and others, and also um, by how well the method is doing. We, we, we worry more about precision and uncertainty. But again, the distinctions become more and more blurred, and there's a lot of cross-fertilization between the methods. Um, machine, le machine learning clearly has the upper hand in marketing. Uh, they tend to get much bigger grants, and their, their uh, conferences are much nicer places, but uh, we're trying to change that, starting with this course. So here's the course text, um, Introduction to Statistical Learning. We're very excited. This is a new book um, by two of our, our graduate students, past graduate students, Gareth James and Daniela Witten, and Rob and myself. The book just came out in, in August 2013, and this course will cover this book in its entirety. The book has, um, has at the end of each chapter, there's examples run through in, in, in the R computing language, and we, we do sessions on R, and so when you do this course, you'll actually learn to use R as well. R is a wonderful um, environment, it's free, and, um, and, and it's a really nice way of doing data analysis. You see there's a second book there, which is um, our more advanced uh, textbook, Elements of Statistical Learning, that's been around for a while. Um, that, that would be uh, serve as a reference book for this course for people who want to understand some of the techniques in, in, in more detail. Now, the nice thing is, this course, not only is this course free, but these books are free as well. The Elements of Statistical Learning has been free, and, and the PDFs available on our websites. This new book is going to be free beginning of January when the course begins. And, uh, and that's a, with agreement with the, um, uh, with the publishers. But if you want to buy the book, that's okay too. It's nice having the hard copy but if you want, the PDF is available. So um, we hope you enjoy the rest of the class.